Okay, so I want to talk to you about Nathaniel Hawthorne's Young Goodman Brown. Now, Young Goodman Brown <clears throat> may be the most perfect short story ever written, but it's absolutely wonderful. It's so much fun to read, and every detail is so perfect and so precise. The pacing of the story, the development of the characters, everything is just wonderful. It's also one of the absolute best examples of that good American Gothic uh, and it is one of the best examples of Hawthorne's anxiety over his puritanical roots. Now, we'll see that also in the Maypole of Marymount uh, and in the Minister's Black Veil, but it's very clear here. And it's also a good introduction to allegory. So there's a lot going on here. Um, the plot is fairly straightforward uh, in terms of its structure. It is uh, parallel, right? It is linear. Everything is told to you uh, as it occurs, start to finish, with the exception of a large uh, section of summary constituted by the final paragraph of the story in which we're told that, you know, uh, from the point he returns to town to the point he dies, uh, his life is summarized in that final paragraph. He goes to church and can't enjoy the hymns. Uh, he's suspicious of everyone around him, yada, 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 right? So up to that point, everything is linear and parallel, but we do get a big period of summary uh, at the end, so watch for that. Otherwise, if it hadn't been for that, the discourse time and the story time are fairly close, right? The story itself takes a matter of hours. It takes, you know, 30 or 40 minutes to read it. That's pretty close. So uh, in terms of plot, pretty pretty simple to follow. Um I really want to focus on, of course, the setting, but also on the characters uh, and how they work allegorically and thematically something to watch that we can then carry over into the other stories by Hawthorne. So the very first thing we want to look at, just this first couple of paragraphs here in the story set up for us that we're dealing with some kind of an allegory. Look at the names of the characters. So we have um, Brown. Now, Goodman is just a title um, uh, Puritans would use this, good men, um, goody for women, or good wife, right? Uh, and so it <clears throat> it's just a title uh, indicating that they're just a, a common person, right? A humble birth. They're, they're not a noble of some kind. Uh, he is young. That's all that means, right? So young Goodman Brown. Now, Brown is an interesting name. It was a very common name. Um, you know, just a Germanic descent, and so um, could indicate that he's German or Dutch, which would not be unusual um, for the period or the area, right? But brown is an interesting name because it's a color, and we have significance of color in here uh, throughout the story, and brown you know, just what does it evoke in you? It's not black, right? So like, black would suggest something evil or shadowy or dark or mysterious. Brown is not black, but it's also not white, <laughs> right? It's not pure. It's not clean. Um, it is a very earthy color. It is a very natural color. It is a very woodsy color. I think all of those things, the plainness of it, um, the earthiness of it, the woodsiness of it, all very important. And the fact that it's a dark color, not a pure color, not white, eh, but not quite black either, lends a lot of ambiguity to the character of young Goodman Brown. And the story is, of course, highly ambiguous. Uh, and so that's a very significant name. So allegorically, um, his name has a lot of symbolism is brown. Her name is much more directly allegorical, right? And if you need clarification between allegory and, and symbolism and how they work together, look at the lecture. But um, his name, which is highly symbolic, may be a little bit less allegorical, but her name is almost purely allegorical, right? Her name is Faith, and it is clear throughout the story as we read that she represents not only his wife, who is named Faith, but his literal Christian faith. Uh, and so every time we see that name and the comments related to it, we think both of his relationship to his wife, but also his Christian faith. 
He, of course, is walking on a path, <laughs> which is highly allegorical in and of itself, um, because life is all often described as a path. Spiritual um, development and growth is often described as a path. Uh, and it is a path that at various times becomes... Um, it is a very simple path to walk, right? It's not a path of tremendous resistance. And so you always have to be weary, uh, wary, rather, not weary, wary of the easy path. This seems a fairly easy path. Um, but it is a path also that walks through areas of great obscurity and fear and darkness. Uh, and all of these things should be warnings to him. And of course, what we never see is him walking the return path, Um which is also very interesting. So something else to watch for here in terms of colors. Faith has pink ribbons. The ribbons, of course, show up later. Pink is an interesting color. Um, it is a very feminine color, of course. Um, and it is a very um, bright and happy color and very near white. It is not the red crimson of blood um, or of sin as we see it used by Hawthorne uh, in the Scarlet Letter, right? It is pink. So it's much it, like Brown, who is not quite uh, black, but is very far along away from the white purity. Pink is not red. It's very close to the white purity. So we get these kind of interesting gradations on the color. Um, and so we, we want to just watch for that. I mean, we don't know exactly what that symbolism means, but it's interesting to us, and it should catch your eye as you read, right? Now, something else to watch for here in regards to the allegory of the path walking and faith uh, is the number of times in which Goodman Brown turns back. Uh, he looks back, he glances back, at various times he turns back. Uh, those are references that you want to watch for as you read the story. Uh, and think about that significance of what he's walking towards, his impulse to turn back, and what that might mean. All right. Now, <clears throat> We're also introduced in the second paragraph to the idea of um, troubling dreams and thoughts. So remember one of the, the issues with the Gothic is a lot of times there is an uncertainty, particularly a phantasmagorical uncertainty between um, what we're actually experiencing uh, and dreams or visions, right? And that is gonna be a problem in this story and it's introduced to us very early um, by faith, with just this suggestion of having troubling thoughts and dreams, um, and associated particularly with this time of year is All Hallows' Eve, right? Uh, and of course, in terms of setting, this has to happen at night. Um, <laughs> and he will return by sunrise, so the whole thing happens in the darkness, uh, and the whole thing happens, of course, into the woods, uh, in the woods is, is the setting. Um, and so we get not only then the natural darkness of night, but an even deeper darkness of the forest. Um, so if we look at the first introduction to the setting, uh, we see that on uh, on page 669, and <clears throat> we're told about a third of the way down the page, he had taken a dreary road, darkened by all the gloomiest trees of the forest, which barely stood aside to let the narrow path creep through and closed immediately behind. It was all as lonely as could be in there is in this peculiarity in such a solitude the traveler knows not who may be concealed by the innumerable trunks and the thick boughs overhead, so that with lonely footsteps he may yet be passing through an unseen multitude. This is the quintessential Gothic setting. Uh, you have a 
you listen to the just the the words used to describe the forest dreary darkened gloomy gloom is hawthorne's word you will see this several times in young goodman brown and you will see it in the other stories that we read by him as well if you are to encapsulate the mood created by a gothic setting especially in hawthorne the word is gloom The suggestion of things unseen, of things unheard, very, very important. And we see immediately he is approached by someone in the forest. His head being turned back, we're told, right? Um, Again, looking back, what's he looking back towards? Well, he's looking back towards faith, right? He's constantly walking away from faith, or so he believes. So he's constantly looking back at it. He even says, faith kept me back a while. But knows that faith doesn't keep him back entirely. It only keeps him back a while. He, he, he proceeds into the deep dusk of the forest, we're told. Um... And those are just the things. As you read through, watch these things. We have a really fantastic example of the phantasmagorical in the staff of the devil, right? Who Who's in the guise of his uh, own grandfather. And he says <clears throat> uh, that the staff was seen to twist and wriggle itself like a living serpent, the commentary, then, is this, of course, must have been an ocular deception assisted by the uncertain light. And again, this is what the Gothic does. You have uncertain light that creates ocular deception, uncertainty. This is also a nice example of the uh, that chiaroscuro, uh, which is that uh, contrast between the darkness and the light. It's the contrast between the darkness and the light here that creates this issue. Uh, it draws your focus to the staff, but then there's an uncertainty about the thing that you're looking at as well. Really an interesting situation. Uh, and of course, there's uncertainty about the man himself because he is not who he appears to be, right? And yet he's recognizable. <clears throat> we have a nice conversation between the two uh, in which... <laughs> <laughs> basically young Goodman Brown's like, I can't be with the devil. What would people in town say? And the devil goes, what would they say? Well, they, they'd say, welcome. Welcome to the party, man. Um, suggesting, of course, that this is the history of Puritans, that on the surface, they are godly, um, uh, pure, pious um, individuals, but that it just masks their bargain with the devil. Right, that Puritans were not better, more pious people than others. They were simply better at obscuring their relationship to sin. The really interesting commentary, in my opinion, from Hawthorne comes on 671, where Youngman and Brown expresses uh, uh, concern for faith. That he says, um, Look, there, there is my wife, Faith. It would break her dear little heart, and I'd rather break my own. Well, very noble, right? So what is the devil's response? He says, no, if that's the case, go your way, Goodman Brown. I would not, for 20 old women like the one hobbling before us, that Faith should come to any harm. Now, on the literal level, this just means, oh, gosh, gee, yeah, you're right. I don't want to hurt your wife, which you could take as sort of uh, sarcasm or something like that, right? Um, but we know we're reading allegorically. So what does he mean by this? Um, it, it's amazingly ambiguous, but it seems to suggest that Satan, the devil, the adversary, right, actually needs people of faith. He doesn't want to destroy the Puritans. That if converting young Goodman Brown is a destruction of the Puritan faith, no way, right? Because he needs these people. 
that is a potent commentary. Now, it's highly ambiguous, right? But as we read, we, we kind of piece that together, that this is what the devil is saying. I need Puritans. I need people of faith, because people of faith can be turned and manipulated, and it's a very powerful thing for him. So that, there's a very interesting sort of commentary uh, in that. And again, this is all about this anxiety that Hawthorne has over his own puritanical roots, right? Um, and as we go throughout, you'll see so many more references to, um, uh, to the looking back, uh, uh, evoking faith, dear faith, little faith, precious faith. But I do want to highlight on 672, Hawthorne is the master of sound. Sound is very difficult to convey in stories a lot of times. But there, there is, uh, in, in this section from the bottom of 672 all the way to the top of 674, there is this build. Um... And it really begins with um, the hoof tramps. So we're, we're told near the bottom of 672, on came the hoof tramps and the voices of the writers, two grave old voices, etc., etc. These people seem to be incorporeal. They ride by unseen, even though there's a shaft of light that they pass through. Um, after they pass... He, he thinks he's recognizing voices, but everything becomes very distorted and uncertain. So he, he's listening to them. The voices come and go. The hoofbeats come and go. He can never see anything. It's just sound. Everything based on sound. Then... We're told about two-thirds of the way down on 673, after he throws his hands up to heaven... Um, we're told aloft in the air as if from the depths of the cloud came a confused and doubtful sound of voices. A little further down, then came a stronger swell of familiar tones. Then further down, we get a very weird thing. Echoes of the forest. Very strange because a forest doesn't echo, right? A forest mutes sound. We've seen that all throughout this is much more an evocation of that traditional Gothic setting of the cathedral or the church in which everything echoes. Hawthorne is using uh, the forest in that way now. It's almost supernatural. How are they echoing, right? But you see the swell in the sound. It's getting louder. It's getting louder. It's getting closer. It's getting closer. And sort of squeezing in on him. We're told the cry of grief, rage, and terror was yet piercing the night. When the unhappy husband held his breath for a response, there was a scream drowned immediately in a louder murmur of voices, fading into far-off laughter as the dark clouds swept away, leaving the clear and silent sky above Goodman Brown. A page and a half of building, 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 swelling sound to screams drowned out by louder screams, immediately silent and floating down from the sky is the pink ribbon of faith and he screams my faith is gone and in my book in the margin i wrote oh my god with three exclamation marks because it's such an intense moment There are intervals of sound and, and silence uh, after that. Um, and this sort of just carries through, carries through, carries through. Remember, he's been looking behind him the whole time, looking back, looking back, looking back, looking back on 676. As everyone's standing around this altarpiece, <clears throat> we have the rampant hag of Goody, uh, Martha Carrier, by the way. <laughs> nice reference to uh, Cotton Mather. Welcome, my children, said the dark figure. 
to the communion of your race. Ye have found, thus young, your nature and your destiny. My children, look behind you. It's really fascinating stuff. And, and the response of young Goodman Brown is this time not to look behind. As his impulse has been, he cries, faith, faith, look up to heaven and resist the wicked one. And like that, everything is gone. Uh, and, and then we're left to wonder, what is it that happened? Was any of this real or was it simply a dream? And it doesn't matter because of the impact that it has on Goodman Brown. There's a lot of commentary in there, right, about the significance of the sort of burden of sin and guilt that the Puritan people carried with them all the time. But it's such an interesting story because the forest is considered such a place of evil. And yet in the story, we clearly see that he's bringing it with him. All that anxiety, all the concern about faith, um, his own weaknesses, his own doubts, all brought with him into the forest. And the forest becomes a place of, um, of mystery, but it's a place that by isolating him, squeezing him it magnifies everything right that deep interiority we'll see this again in the minister's black veil where instead of a forest it's the veil over the minister's face that squeezes him into this deep interior space so he hears voices but he can't see faces right because of the veil and everything is obscured now, this looking back, um, I, there's, a, there's a sort of theological point to this, and I just want to highlight this because not everybody's familiar with this. Um, the Puritans were very concerned um, with the idea of backsliding, that once you had um, left sin behind, right, this idea of going back. And so this idea of looking back and backsliding uh, is something that comes uh, from the Old Testament of the story of, of Lot uh, in the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, Lot is told to flee um, with his wife, right? And they're told not to look back because looking back sim symbolizes a, still a desire for evil and wickedness rather than looking forward which symbolizes this commitment to God and to this conversion experience and to holier things. And so in looking back then, she's transformed into a pillar of salt. Um, and, and so that thematically carries into the story, right? What's interesting, of course, is that he's looking back to faith and walking towards uh, uh, the evil, uh, or so he thinks, right? Which is the opposite of what's happening in the story of Lot. And I think it's a commentary, again, by Hawthorne on the ambiguity of understanding what is good and what is evil, that, that the Puritans are people who thought they were walking towards goodness and away from evil, but were they? Because their actions often led them to do things that uh, seem quite wicked, as, as we've already seen, and that was something that Hawthorne was concerned about. So that's why you have this weird tension between walking forward, looking back. Um, and of course, the strange thing is, for Goodman Brown, is when he arrives, faith is there. He thought he was walking from it the whole time, and really, uh, it was there in the middle of the forest. And so, lots of ambiguity, lots of confusion, but there's a lot of things that, that Hawthorne sets up in here with the gloom, with the backwards looking, the obscurity of things seen or heard, the development of sound, that he carries over through his other stories. Uh, and I wanted to highlight them here so that you would look for them in the other stories. And then in the other stories, maybe we can focus on some other stuff. Uh, we could spend hours talking about young Goodman Brown, but hopefully some of the things I've pointed out to you will help you enjoy and appreciate the story uh, a little bit more.